Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcikowski. I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and the director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It is really a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin American communities across the Americas. Today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. Raquel Moreira is an assistant professor of communication studies at Southwestern University. Thayani Enriquez, a doctoral student at Northwestern University and an affiliate of the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce Raquel in just a minute. I am delighted to note that this quarter, our series is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Culture and Communication, the Department of Communication Studies, the Department of Radio, Television and Film, and the Program in Latin American and Caribbean Studies. But before we go to the seminar, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Fires, Yojiwe, Potawatomi, and Orawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and institutions' history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me say briefly a little bit more about how the seminar will unfold. First, Tayani will tell us more about Raquel's research and career in just a minute. Then Raquel will present her work. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Thayani, the screen is all yours. Good morning, everyone. Pablo, thank you for having me here as a moderator for today's seminar. It's an absolutely honor for me to present Professor Raquel Moreira, who in just a few minutes is going to talk about her work called Mestizagem, Authenticity, and Racial Speciality in Anita's Girl from Rio. Anita's music video for Girl from Rio utilizes a series of symbolic dichotomies that authenticate a particular construction of Brazil's Rio de Janeiro, one that sanctions notions of peaceful racial mixing or mestizagem, while exposing, perhaps unintentionally, the city's unblack racial speciality. Professor Moreira hosts a PhD in Communication Studies from the University of Denver and a master's degree in Media Studies from the Federal Fluminense University in Brazil. She also has a bachelor's degree in Journalism from the Estácio de Sá University. Professor Moreira is an assistant professor of Communication at Southwestern University. Before working at Southwestern University, she worked at Graceland University. Broadly speaking, Professor Moreira's research investigates the racialized and classed dimensions of femininities in Brazil and in the US, paying special attention to how performances of citizenship are constrained or enabled by embodiments of normative and peripheral femininities. She is the author of the awarded book called Beaches Unleashed, Performance and Embodied Politics in Favela Funk. She also has several book chapters and journal articles published in prestigious venues, such as Women's Studies and Communication. So please join in welcoming Professor Moreira to the screen. All right. Thank you, Tayani, for this lovely introduction. So today we will talk about, share my screen. Mr. Sage in Latinidad and Racial Speciality in Anita's Girl from Rio, and I'm Raquel Moreira from Southwestern University. Okay, so Brazilian pop star Anita has recently achieved several indicators of a successful crossover to the US music market. 
She had songs in Billboard's Top 100. She was a headliner at the 2021 Coachella Music Festival. And recently she received an MTV Video Music Award for Best Latin Video. Despite singing primarily in English and Spanish, Anita is very adamant about claiming her Brazilian identity in tandem with her Latinidad. Her effort to cross over became obvious with the release of the 2021 song and music video for Girl From Rio, which has amassed 45 million views on YouTube by December 2022. Girl From Rio is an interpolation of Vinicius de Moraes and Tom Jobim's Renal, The Girl From Ipanema, which narrates the delicate bodily movements of a blonde, blue-eyed, slender woman in the upper-class neighborhood of Ipanema, Rio de Janeiro. In this presentation, I offer a close reading of Anita's music video for Girl From Rio, paying special attention to how she deploys racial hybridity and mobility to construct and authenticate Brazilianness and Latinidad. So through a series of visual and textual dichotomies, the music video aims to create an authentic, globally recognizable Brazilian identity that relies on constructions of mestizagem and racial hybridity, while concurrently attempting to tap into established representations of US Latinidad. Ultimately, Anita's music video is one among many examples of how mestizagem and Latinidad work together to sanction both the movement and stagnation of certain bodies, working relational, relationally to move closer to whiteness and away from blackness. So critical scholars in calm studies and rhetoric in particular have continued to push for racist central role in the study of oppressive systems and marginalized populations. Recently, this call has been renewed by Flores' racial rhetorical criticism, whose central role is, and I quote her, the development of theories that account for the rhetoricity of race. That is, if we argue both in communication and across other disciplines that race is a social construct or a discursive materialization, then we should lead the theoretical conversations about race. U.S. Latinx studies in rhetoric and beyond have consistently attended to the study of the rhetoricity of racialized bodies, both imposed and performed. As race and ethnicity are foundational in the understanding of Latinx struggles in the United States. Often, these experiences and the systems that shape them are understood within the framework of Latinidad and Mississippi. Soto Vega and Chavez advocate that doing Latinx rhetorical criticism means, and I quote them, to render a thorough explanation of racialized violence and erasure, which unavoidably includes researching coloniality, white supremacy, and imperialism as systems of domination entwined with race and ethnicity. While scholars recognize the possible limitations of Latinidad, few in communication studies have analyzed the consequences of its symbolic quest for differentiation from blackness and indigeneity by its proximity to whiteness. The conflation of race and ethnicity in the case of Latinas in the United States has led to the invisibility of intergroup hierarchy, violence, and exclusion. Therefore, more than a matter of including race as an analytical box to be ticked, Soto Vega and Chavez claimed that the goal of Latinx rhetorical criticism should be instead to scrutinize the entire settler colonial heteronormative system from which most white dominant scholarship arises. Otherwise, we risk reproducing exclusionary colonial and racist logics. So the seminar is concerned precisely with the critical analysis of how Girl from Rio might reproduce colonial capitalistic and anti-Black logics that connect Mestizaje and Latinidad in the United States and in Latin America, specifically in Brazil. So in order to analyze the role um, of and connections between misogyny, misogyny and Latinidad in Anita's Girl from Rio, I start by reviewing scholarship in racial spatiality and mobility, accepting Hawthorne's premise that racism is also a spatial practice. Next, I delve into the concepts of Latinidad as it has been studied in US context, as well as misogyny, misogyny as it has been studied in Latin America and in the US, including how this construction is indeed transnational. Then I analyze Anita's music video for Girl From Rio, offering brief biographical details about the artist. So the ethno-racial and spatial dimensions of the text suggest that Girl From Rio represents the crossover of the U.S. market via dual simultaneous movements that operate via one, identifiable signs of Latinidad, and two, recognizable assemblages of Mississauga and Mississauga. 
Both sanctions establish ideas of authentic Brazilianness and US Latinidad in opposition to blackness and in proximity to whiteness. So let's talk about racial spatiality and mobility. To understand how race and mobility are represented in Anita's Go For Me, or I adopt the concept of racial spatiality, right? So drawing from um, Carter's work, Harrison defines racial spatiality as the perception that certain racialized bodies are, accept, are expected to occupy certain social spaces and complementarily that the presence of other bodies creates social disruption, moral unbalance and or demands explanation. Because this definition implies movement, I argue then that not only spaces are demarcated by race and class, signifying that the production of space is tied to the production of difference, but that mobility too is shaped by race and class and gender, right? In the case of Anita's music video, appeals to mestizagem allow her movement through real segregated racial spatiality. So critical scholars have agreed that Capitalism's tendency to racially differentiate takes spatial form and a form which is often an extension of colonial spatiality. Brazilian racial spatiality has normalized practices, according to Mitchell Wunther, of marking public spaces as white or light skin or black. In the case of Rio, for instance, favelas and references to favelas are simultaneously classed and racialized as the place where poor black folks and mixed race brown people from the Brazilian Northeast live. In contrast, middle class and rich areas are mostly inhabited by white and light skinned mestizos and are spaces in which blackness is under constant surveillance. The mobility of black Brazilians is thus controlled and placed under scrutiny, although not always successfully for sure. At the same time, global constructions of favelas and their connections to blackness are also highly commodified. As Mitchell says, the transnational circulation of favela images glamorize and capitalize on intertwined aesthetics of blackness and poverty. While symbolic references to favelas are meant to be contradictory, race can be differently articulated vis-a-vis -vis representations that delineate who is included as multiracial and global, versus those persons excluded as black, lawless, and deviant. Indeed, exclusion is a part of racial speciality effects, this last part being essential to Anita's depictions of race and space in Girl from Rio, as it is mishisaging or racial hybridity, it's resulting in racial hybridity that enables her mobility in the two versions of the city. If, as Carter says, spaces are colored with the expectation that certain bodies belong in certain places and not in others, that also means that some bodies are able to move through different spaces more freely than others. This mobility is physical and symbolic. One's body may be able to occupy physical spaces that are restricted to others based on race and class and gender, also known as racial passing. But this movement also includes the capability to occupy representational spaces such as mainstream success. Both points uh, matter for this presentation's argument as they can be connected to the physical and symbolic movement associated with Mississippi and Latinidad in contrast with the confinement to which bodies racialized as black are subjected. So let's talk about then Latinidad and Mississippi income studies and beyond. The Latinidad and Mississippi are staple concepts in the study of Latinas, especially in media, and are often either analytically paired or assumed to work together with racial mixing presumed to be a feature of Latinidad. To Molina Guzman in her collaboration with Valdivia, Latinidad is, and I quote her, a social construct that is shaped by external forces, such as marketing, advertising, popular culture, and the US census, and internally through the individual subjectivities and communal cultural expressions of people who identify as Latino. While this definition does not directly reference race and ethnicity, the author recognizes these dimensions in the concept. 
So drawing attention to the media's tendency to collapse race and ethnicity, Molina Guzman declares that mainstream media creates a Latina ethno-racial identity that is, and I quote her, unstable with sometimes converging and competing definitions of ethnic and racial performances of Latinidad. These constructions rely on cultural or ethnic features, but media signifiers of Latinidad depend on phenotypic racial markers such as facial features, hair texture, and skin color, with Latinas being essentially racialized as brown or, as she says, not quite white but rarely black. Latinas as brownness is highly commodified as exotic and hypersexualized. Still, the racially ambiguous space they occupy in U.S. media achieved via mestizaje places them closer to whiteness. Consequently, Latinidad's immediacy to whiteness is the way through which racial, racially nebulous Latinas like Anita are able to cross over to the U.S. market. In Girl From Rio, Anita's racial hybridity is mobile as it is used to represent the light-skinned girl from Ipanema as well as the authentically Brazilian and dark-skinned girl from Rio. Mestizaje and racial ambiguity have been approached in communication studies as a form of transgressive racial passing. In her analysis of Ricky Martin, Calafel argues that the Puerto Rican singer ability to pass in some respects is due to the haziness in his embodiment of Mississauga and his performances of gender sexuality, which are simultaneously excessive and even parodic of the Latin lover desperado stereotype. Calafel further contends that in this alternation of the body, there is power in that people are able to access structures of privilege previously out of their reach. The author also traces the distrust of other Latinas who thought Martin was easy for U.S. Americans to accept as his bodily features were read primarily by dark skin Caribbean Latinas as Anglo passing. While previous scholarship on Latinas in media have explored these tensions, the focus is usually on analyzing racial ambiguity vis-a-vis -vis whiteness and therefore as potentially transgressive against its boundaries. So Latinidad's lack of racial specificity in which different groups are casually lumped together and racialized as brown ends up erasing its at least partial reliance, reliance on anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity. Sotovega and Chavez cautions that this grouping, even when intended as a collisional gesture, could end up masking the exclusion and oppression of Latinas who are not white or mestizos. Likewise, Molina Guzman asserts that even as the ideology of racial mixture and democracy is celebrated among Latinas, whiteness and white notions of beauty, you know, as blanqueamiento still reign supreme in the United States and in Latin America. It is not by chance that Mitchell proposes that scholars approach ideas about race as, and I quote her, a relational understanding of interconnected histories, narratives, and social structures in the Americas. It is possible to assert thus that the distinct racial formations of these locations and their divergent iterations of anti-Blackness influence both media and identity constructions of Latinidad. This may seem different, but both the strict U.S. racial hierarchy in which racial categories are more rigorously defined with Blackness at the bottom of the ladder and the more porous Latin American for, um, racial formations which favor racial mixing as long as it moves toward whiteness and away from Blackness similarly reinforce the same racial order. So while slowly changing, recent scholarship on constructions of race and racism in Brazil suggests that the country's structural neglect of the matter persists. Like other Latin American country, Latin American nations that enslaved and mass murdered Africans, Brazil's racist apparatus stems from colonialism and the lasting effects of coloniality and capitalism. One foundational characteristic of Brazilian racism can be exemplified by the fact that the country has officially incorporated whiteness into its nation building project via misogyny. This miscegenation policy called brinqueamento or whitening or blanqueamento in Latin America facilitated the migration of white Europeans to Brazil in the late 19th and early 20th century with the purpose of lightening the population by encouraging the racial mixing between black and indigenous Brazilians with white Europeans. 
Brazil's and other Latin American colonial frameworks of racial hierarchy thus encouraged racial mixing provided the population steadily moved toward whiteness over time as racial whitening was perceived as a sign of progress. Such obviously racist ideas have been transformed over time into a whimsical racial democracy narrative that conceals anti-indigeneity and anti-blackness. So still prevailing in Brazilian culture and institutions thus is the myth of different races, especially black, white, indigenous, mixing in a harmonious way that was popularized, popularized by Brazilian anthropologist Gilberto Freire. The ideological construction of the country's miscegenated Brazilian as thus is grounded on concepts of non-race or a diversity of shades that one erases the violence of miscegenation, especially of enslaved black women, and two leads to beliefs that racially mixed Brazil is free from anti-black and anti-indigenous racism. Although statistics about poverty, incarceration, police brutality, political and institutional representation and more suggest differently. As a music video made for global, but primarily US audiences, Anita's Brazilian is, and it becomes legible via the ethno-racial clumping that forms US Latinidad. Pereira de Sá suggests in her analysis of Girl From Rio that Anita does not escape cliches about Brazilianness or Latinidad, including ideas such as, and I call her joy and happiness that emanate from the tropics, the beach as a space of sociability, the eroticism with the focus on the botox of bikini wearing girls. These platitudes in order to appear authentic to global audiences must include references to blackness as cool, sensual, and joyful. Paul Geroy suggests that authenticity enhances the appeal of selective cultural commodities and has become an important element in the mechanism of the mode of racialization necessary to make non-European and non-American music acceptable items in an expanded pop market. That way, Girl From Rio is able to reach a global audience as authentically representing Brazilianness through recognizable cultural iterations connected to mestizaging and Latinidad. So let's talk about Anita's Girl From Rio, right? So the opening of Anita's Girl From Rio is a direct sonic and visual reference to Vinicius de Moraes and Tom Jobim's 1963 global hit, The Girl from Ipanema, which, um, in which Anita arrives as a set, at a set um, adorned with the painting of several Rio's well-known touristic attractions, such as Acuzalapa, Sugarloaf, and Ipanema's Beach, signature sidewalk stones, as you can see in the photo in the slide. That version of Rio is depicted in pastel tones where Anita's movements are delicate and synchronized and choreographed. Clothes have this vintage 1950s look in baby blue, yellow, and pink tones. And all bodies are slender with Anita being the only woman sharing these scenes with several racially diverse, although mostly light-skinned men. As they move, Gently in synchrony, she hops in the passenger seat of a 50s-style convertible, sitting next to a mestizo-presenting man who wears a chauffeur uniform, and the ideal Rio opens to a bright color, chaotic Rio. In the subsequent shots, Anita is shown getting out of a bus in a provocative outfit, followed by her father. And both arrive at a crowded artificial beach located in Rio's working-class neighborhood of Mare, known as Piscinon de Ramos. The bossa nova melody gives into a trap beat intended with Anita's transformation from the light skin, red hair, slim, delicate, sexy, but classy mestiza from Ipanema to the suntan, long hair, brown, wavy um, hair, provocative bikini wearing girl from Rio. If the first Rio is clean, organized, and cosmopolitan, the different Rio, as she defines it in the lyrics, is disorder, animated, sexualized, and mostly. Black. So Anita often places her career origins in, in favela funk, an Afro-Brazilian diasporic musical genre and cultural movement that emerged out of Rio's favelas in the 1980s. She went viral with a how-to twerk video in 2010, entering the favela funk scene then until going mainstream in Brazil in 2013, with more like a pop kind of feel in her music. In 2017, Anita began her attempts at crossing over to the US by 
um, recording her first song in Spanish. For Pereira de Sá's assessment, and with which I agree, Anita's appropriation of Girl from Ipanema is a strategy that aims to reiterate a cliche, right, understood here as a utopian and idealized image of the Brazilian musical identity, with the goal to open doors and amplify her international reach. The author further argued that Girl from Rio works to include other more diverse territories and soundscapes to the global imaginary of Rio and Brazil. And while I believe this evaluation to be valid, I argue instead that this process of inclusion inevitably relies on and reinforces connections between mestizagem and Latinidad and their associated physical and social mo mobility at the expense of Blackness. So let's watch a few seconds of um, the music video of Girl From Rio so we won't have any trouble keeping this on YouTube. start our analysis with um, mestizagem and Latinidad in the music video. So mestizaje and Latinidad work together to reinforce and sell authentic representations of Latinas in the United States. In Anita's Girl from Rio, references to mestizagem and Latinidad are both explicit and concealed. Among the more overt mentions of racial mixing appears within the first minute of the music video when the audience is presented with the making of a vintage family portrait in which all members are dressed in 1950s style pastel color clothing. A scene featuring Anita's actual family and their real life experience of finding out she had a half brother. The racial makeup and narrative surrounding her blended family conspicuously references Meshisaji. For instance, she sings, just found out I have another brother, saying daddy, but a different mother. This was something that I always wanted. Baby, it's a love affair. The lyrics are illustrated with images of the family in which Anita, her mother brought and brother, embody different shades of white and light skinned brown. Her father is Pardo or black and white mixed race and her half brother is a light skinned black man. Anita, who is once again transformed into the classy light-skinned mestiza from Ideal Rio, stands between each brother, kissing each on the cheek, as the newly found brother is casually incorporated into the family. He's greeted by the singer with an effusive hug and is too welcomed by all members of the family, subsequently joining the making of the portrait. And I will show you this scene, please. Okay. While the scene um, elicits many possible readings of the intersections of class, race, and gender and sexuality, such as the invisibility of Black women, the primary meaning for the purpose of this analysis is that nonviolent racial mixing or mestizaging is a fact of authentic Brazilian culture. In this case, Pardo children conceived supposedly out of wedlock are nonchalantly accepted and incorporated into light skinned families, since ultimately, mestizaging is the mechanism enabling approximation to whiteness, something to which all Latinas should aspire. That way, racial ambiguity melts into whiteness in Brazil, according to Mitchell. Coincidentally or not, this representation of racial mixing and hybridity happened in the 1950s style organized ideal Rio, which 
one could then assume that there is the place of Mishisaji and movement toward whiteness and toward middle-classness. Blackness, on the other hand, is confined to the artificial beach space. So Girl from Rio displays blackness and chaos, sex, joy, and strong colors in contrast with the order iconic pastel color in light skin Rio, Anita disavows as the only representation of the city. While the music video and the lyrics make no explicit mention of race, it possesses numerous visual references to both Brazilian and US blackness. The song opens with the verses, let me tell you about a different Rio, the one I'm from, but not the one that you know. Don't want you meet when you don't have no real, which is Brazilian currency. Accompanied with images of Anita getting off a pack bus and walking to a crowded artificial beach in which black people are featured prominently and in which Anita in her new look effort effortlessly fits in. Shots of differently sized black women in small bikinis flourish as well as images of people having apparent arguments, barbecuing on the sand, sun tanning, twerking, flirting, and sensually kissing. So in her effort to showcase an authentic Rio, Anita insinuates that the chaotic and black city she introduces in the music video is an unfamiliar image to her US audience as if non-touristy poor areas of Rio, of Rio have not been paraded in global media. Of course, the strategy of showing an authentic Rio has been repeatedly reproduced in cultural products made for cultural audiences. The supposed authenticity often involves depictions of Afro-Brazilians that is hypersexualized, like babies having babies like it doesn't matter, poor, the one you meet when you don't have no real, and joyful, with dancing and socializing, among others. Most importantly, it revives ideas of Brazil as a racial paradise where racial tension and oppression do not exist. As such, Anita's Rio Rio portrays black folks, but not into black racism. While more can be said about these not so original depictions of blackness, I want to shift my attention instead to Anita's distinct role in this scenario. As a vehicle of this genuine representation of Rio, Anita seems to be reproducing images of the mulata or the hypersexualized mixed race light skinned black woman whose depictions are a vital feature of Mississauga and Mississauga in Latin America and in the United States. In that sense, shifting images of the mulata continue to populate mainstream media texts in contradictory ways. She concurrently signifies positive racial hybridity via the dilution of blackness, as well as negative sexual excess and availability. In Girl from Rio, Anita mutates as she moves into another Rio. Her skin is visibly darker. She wears a wig of dark brown, wavy and coarse hair, and her one piece swimsuit is revealing and provocative. So I will leave the gender dimension of this representation to a different project. Instead, I want to highlight that white and mestiza women darkening themselves to market a particular vision of Brazilian authenticity is not an unusual move. Portuguese-born and Brazilian-raised singer and actress Carmen Miranda became famous in the United States for performing in Afro-Brazilian Baiana, essentially, which strengthened uh, Brazil's and Latinidad's global images of racial hybridity popularized first in the 1940s. Not only that, but the version of Brazil Miranda advanced in her performances was that of the sexualized exotic tropics, contrasting with the cosmopolitan whitened version that Brazilian bossa nova advanced later in the 1960s. Curiously, both these tensions, both um, these tensions are present in Girl from Rio from the city soundscapes to the unspoken racial speciality of each Rio. So marketed as a, an authentically Brazilian product, Girl from Rio utilizes a reversed form of racial passing to sanction its cultural legitimacy. In it, we see Anita becoming a mulata physically and performatively in order to stage what she's presenting as Rio's true image. Scholarship in racial passing regularly focuses on how light-skinned people of color are able not only to assimilate into whiteness, but also benefit from upward socioeconomic mobility as a result. Mestizagem and Latinidad complicate these perspectives on racial passing as these ideologies were thought to erase racial difference. Hence, white Latin American countries with intense miscegenation were assumed to be some kind of racial democracy. The type of passing as mulata Anita engages in Girl from Rio 
one in which this light-skinned brown woman is able to temporarily transform her physical appearance and performances is not so much a denial of racial difference as it is an affirmation of the belief that blackness can be unproblematically diluted and selectively used for the sake of cultural authenticity. Intentionally or not, Girl From Rio exposes how space is racialized in the city. Although race in the Americas share ideological features such as white supremacy and anti-Blackness, the limits and boundaries of these categories are influenced by particular locations, their histories, cultures, and et cetera. In the US context, for instance, race developed into a more strict and polarized white-Black binary with whiteness possessing somewhat solid boundaries. In Brazil and many other Latin American countries in which misogyny and misogyny was encouraged as a whitening of the population strategy, race is structured as a continuum. If one has any European ancestry, they have the chance to be considered potentially white or at least not black. Colorism is also a result of this practice. To Ribeiro, colorism in, in Brazil is about a society that based on skin tone defines which spaces people can and cannot occupy. The way that way, the darker a person's skin is in Brazil, the more she will suffer processes of exclusion. Light skinness derived from racial mixing can be conceived as a kind of Latin American whiteness and is thus somewhat fluid and inclusive, since one can claim it loosely based on phenotype and sociocultural practices. This, in turn, makes mishisaging mobile. Let's then talk about racial speciality, uh, mishisaging mobility in Girl from Rio. So, you know, Hugh Janeiro might give the impression, especially to outsiders, that the, Rio's, the city is relatively racially integrated, where folks who are different races coexist somewhat peacefully. It is true that favelas, for instance, are visible and present in most, if not all, neighborhoods of the city. However, public spaces are heavily regulated by repressive apparatuses like the military police and social institutions like schools and cultural constructions that associate Blackness with violence, for instance. Race and space organize the city in terms of Mitchell Walther's understanding of Brazilian racial speciality, or, and I quote her here, the existence of boundaries created for the specific purpose of maintaining and limiting the movement of certain racial groups and for the maintenance of power of dominant groups. While segregation laws like U.S.'s Jim Crow did not exist in Rio, designated spaces based on race and class certainly did and still do, as various forms of violence are used to maintain boundaries that excludes, ex exclude marginalized people in Brazil. Hence, favelas, beaches, shopping malls, parks, schools, and more are all mediated by racial speciality in that city, limiting the mobility of Black Brazilians, especially of those who are working class. Anita avoided connections with favelas in her music video when she first went mainstream in Brazil between 2012 and 2013. In fact, many artists from favela funk, a genre and musical movement that originated in Rio's lungs, were resentful of what they perceived was Anita's use of funk as a stepping stone to success, later discarding it, despite having power to represent it in the media. It isn't surprising, however, that in her international career, Anita has sought to reclaim and perhaps reframe her origins. The singer no longer shies away from making symbolic references to favelas, be them through images or via verbal allusions in lyrics, music videos, and live performances. In Girl From Rio, um, Anita's association with favelas is explicit and intentional according to interviews with her, her agent, and representatives from her label who also confirmed that the song choice was meant to catapult the singer's crossover to the US market. For instance, she introduces the verses Honorio Gurgel, which is her working class neighborhood, forever, babies having babies like it doesn't matter, yet the streets have raised me, I'm favela. It is unlikely that Anita's goal was to indicate how space is racialized in the city, but as an international star aspiring to enter the US market as a light-skinned brown Brazilian woman, she understands that such references might help paint her as authentic. And although the music video does not show images of favelas, the dichotomous illustrations of an ideal and a real Rio de Janeiro, along with the song's lyrics, suggest a class and racialized organization of the city, one that Anita and her family are able to overcome as the only characters in it circulating in both versions of the city. 
Additionally, this verse also employs U.S. references to blackness and space in that allusions to the streets are often used in rap to provide experiential credibility to hip hop performers, essentially as a form of appealing to authenticity. The music video makes it evident that racial spatiality changes in the movement between the two rios. That can be attested by the fact that moving from one environment to another elicits a drastic change in who is occupying those spaces and how those environments are organized. Girl from Rio then not only infers that certain bodies belong to particular spaces, but also that only a few can circulate in and belong to both areas. This motion to different parts of the city is demonstrated by Anita's physical appearance and bodily performances. In her movement through the city's physical space from an organized urban white and mestizo landscape to a tumultuous working class black environment, the singer darkens herself in order to belong in Rio Rio. Accordingly, it is not just that these spaces are structured in racialized manners, but that the singer uses performances that elicit racial recognition, such as blackness as joyful, erotic, and chaotic, to contrast idealization versus authenticity in the depictions of the city. In reality, these spatial ideas of racial recognition are not that porous if you are actually Black in Rio. The ideological device that allows for Anita's mobility to seem effortless and accessible is undoubtedly mishisaging. In Girl from Rio, racial hybridity's mobility is inadvertently contrasted to the stagnation of Black folks. As one of the few mixed race people who are capable to circulate in both versions of the city, Anita is not shown as out of place in either. She's simply represented as versatile, an adaptability that is necessarily dependent on anti-Black constructions of misogyny, since it is her ability to become and perform light skinness that enables her movement. And here I like to challenge previous readings of Mrs. Sahe in the US as kind of a positive or empowering hybridity to argue that it is indeed a Latin American version of whiteness since mixing is only valued as a way to dilute blackness and indigeneity. Moreover, the mobility of the mestizo happens because of their contiguity to whiteness, meaning that it does little to address the lack of mobility indigenous and black folks have as a result. Another way in which Mississauga enables action in Girl from Rio is through its use of legible images of US Latinidad. As I have argued throughout this presentation, racial formations in the US and Latin America may be distinct, but are relational. Latinidad is one such ideology that connects this disparate context, especially in its highly commodified media form. Molina Guzman asserts that, and I quote, her contemporary US media often depict Latinas as not quite white, but rarely black, instead occupying a space of racially ambiguous and commodifiable brownness. Anita's reliance on racial scripts of US Latinidad, such as light skin brownness, hypersexualities, small bikinis and large botox, beaches and partying, as well as the joy of the tropics, is unquestionably deliberate and in alignment with her goal to enter the US music market. Anita uses both global representations of Brazilianness, the exotic and erotic tropics image popularized by Kami Miranda, as well as the cosmopolitan re refined portrayal amplified by Bossa Nova. Finally, Girl from Rio highlights two concurrent movements, that of Anita's mobility within Rio, sanctioned by Misha Saging, and that of her entry in the US music market, supported by Latinidad. So, you know, Anita's Girl from Rio has effectively assisted the singer in her crossover to the US media market by using familiar constructions of global Brazilianness and US Latinidad. In fact, Anita has become the first Brazilian pop artist to top Spotify's global chart and the first one to win an award at the MTV's Music, music Video Awards. This analysis suggests that Anita is simply following a proven formula to succeed as a light skinned brown Latina in the US since and I quote Melina Guzman again here, a cursory review of television films in tabloid celebrity coverage of Latinas indicate that the commercialized contours of the Latina body have retained their shape, curvaceous, dark hair, dark eyes, and phenotypic features that skew towards whiteness and away from blackness. And although not the focus of this essay, Go From Rio elicits rich and complex intersectional readings of race, class, gender, and sexuality, which scholars should attend to in the near future. And while premise on hybridity depictions among Latin American cultures, 
distinctions, I'm sorry, among Latin American cultures are paradoxically flattened in favor of homogenous visions of Latinidad in the U.S. Valdivia affirms that hybridity may be the most authentic element of U.S. Latino culture and is inherently entwined in the commodification of Latinidad. One of the most damaging results of this amalgamation of distinct cultures and histories is the previously mentioned clumping of race and ethnicity. As hybrid and flexible as Latinidad may be, its racial limits are evident. In this way, Latinidad becomes antithetical to blackness in the US. And ultimately, Anita must appear brown in order to successfully fulfill the racial scripts associated with Mississauga and Latinidad in the US media landscape. It is true that questions surrounding inclusion and exclusions of Latinidad are slowly becoming more popular in communication studies, although a lot still needs to be done to trace how Mestizaje and Latinidad together support anti-Blackness in the U.S. and Latin America. Instead of focusing on the liberatory possibilities of such hybrid racial assemblages, this presentation highlights how these constructions continue to work hegemonically to differentiate Latinidad from Blackness. This task, I believe, should take priority for scholars in Latinx studies. Following Soto Vega and Chavez's call for a racial rhetorical criticism that addresses the specificity of racializing processes for different groups, such as the declumping of race and ethnicity in the case of Latinx in the US, we should pay special attention to the way certain racial formations negate or erase others. Indeed, the lack of critical examinations of the racial formations included and excluded in Latinidad and Mesisaje have resulted, even if unintentionally, in the safeguarding of anti-Blackness in our communities and fields of study. Examining Anita's Girl from Rio is one but small step into the work needed to unpack how colonial and contemporary racial formations in the U.S. and Latin America collide and collaborate in current expressions of Mesisaje and Latinidad. In this seminar, I was particularly interested in illuminating Latinidad's mobility via mestizaje toward mainstream success, whiteness, and even blackness, as long as it is temporary and under the guise of authenticity. Ultimately, Latinidad's mobility is enabled by mestizaje. Uncritically embracing racial mixing and hybridity as an undoubtable threat to whiteness obscures its foundational premise of diluting blackness. What will happen then if communication scholars of racial rhetorical criticism study Latinidad and Mississauga vis-a-vis blackness instead of whiteness? How would this shift in focus impact our most foundational assessments of this concept's limitations and potentials? Like Sotovega and Chavez, I believe that Latinas have a crucial responsibility to investigate this relationship as a racialized group who has a profoundly different relationship to whiteness. This distinct and complex connection might help explain, for instance, Latinas conservative political beliefs and voting patterns. As communication studies move toward decolonial knowledges and politics, my hope is that scholars of Latinx America in the US and beyond continue to question and rethink established constructions in our field, such as Mississauga and Latinidad, as expressions of coloniality that necessarily depend on the degradation of indigeneity and blackness. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Raquel, for a great uh, seminar. It's been a pleasure to have you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tayani, for great introduction and moderation. And uh, I want to invite uh, our audience to join us next week for the next seminar of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you very much again, Raquel. This has been great. Thank you.